Um, how many of you get kind of burned out and feel like, I could say the F word, I mean, I'm really tempted to say the F word, but I did allow them to record me, so it is being recorded, um, so I'm going to refrain from doing that, but um, fuck, I mean, it's really, um, it's really tough to stay in this fight, you know? Um, I would like to tell you that I have all the answers and that the science has finally come to full maturity and we're ready to just take on the world and prove everybody that has said all these negative things about us wrong. Um, and we're getting there. I mean, I, I'm really, I have a lot of hope and a lot of enthusiasm because as I kind of prepared this talk and looked at it, you know what? The literature is coming to us. The things that we've been saying for the last 10, 15, even 20 years. I think back to some of the stuff that Rimland wrote 25, 30 years ago. And you know what? It's coming. It's coming. But we, you know, we said gut bugs 15 years ago, and everybody thought, you guys are just completely whacked out. Gut bugs are causing autism? Have you seen any of the literature? I'm going to show you some of it, but yeah, those bad things that live downstairs in these kids make them crazy. How many of you believe that? Yeah, how many of you live that? I mean, you know, so goes the kids' yeast level, so goes mom's level of sanity that day, you know, pretty much. It's here now, okay? I mean, great papers from major universities starting to support us. This afternoon, I'll be in a think tank with some of those researchers working on the GI stuff. Yesterday, I was in a think tank working on seizure disorders. You know what? People are comfortable with the idea that oxidative stress and inflammation in the brain is a foundation of autism now. Researchers from Harvard and, and Baylor and, and all over are starting to say, yeah, we get that. Ten years ago, when we started to propose that idea that oxidative stress and inflammation in the brain was a big deal for these kids, and that's maybe the, the connection with vaccines and some of these other things that are going on, perhaps that's related to the, the gluten and casein story, they now accept it. So the revolution, which is really a grassroots revolution driven by moms and dads, let's face it, medicine didn't come to us and say, how do we solve your problems, right? They didn't say, oh, wow, there's an epidemic of autism. We need to help you with this. Did you get that reaction from anybody? I didn't get that reaction. I'm a doctor. I didn't get that reaction. I know my wife got it from me, but, you know, after I was already in the fight. If I didn't have a kid with autism, I wouldn't be standing up here, I guarantee you. I'd probably be, it's, let's see, a weekend, a holiday weekend, I'd be sailing. That's what I would be doing. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Um, there have been some remarkable changes, and I want to go through some of them. I'm giving a little time for some extra people to filter in if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, now, I did your note-taking for you and published it. You can have this free. This article, which is a complete review of what we're doing and where the world is going with biomarkers, and we could even add a few more since we published this, but um, this is available. Just email me. You got the email address right there? drbrasfordal.com. Um, I've done this at several conferences. I get a few hundred emails after the conference, and I answer them all. It's fine. Don't feel bad about it. Bug me until you get the article from us. It's... Um, about 170 references to the medical literature, and we talk pragmatically about the laboratory data that can substantiate what's wrong with your child and then what you can do about it. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Now, I can't give you 170 references in an hour lecture, but this will do it for you, and you can give it to your pediatrician or your gastroenterologist or anybody because it's laid out systematically. Now, I'm not going to go through the lecture about biomarkers. I want to do everybody else's science, not talk about our stuff so much. Um, I want to, before I get started really into this, I want to thank some folks. Um, pay attention to who the sponsors are that are helping to pay for this, whether it's, you know, OxyHealth or uh, Integrative uh, Therapeutic Clinics or some of the other sponsors. We have some great laboratories here. I couldn't do the research that I do and come up with these biomarkers without labs like Laboratory Philippe Auguste and Doctors Data and Genova, Great Plains and the other laboratories that give us the really solid data, really good stuff to help identify how to treat your kid objectively. So thank you all for that. Now, in medicine, normally what happens is we get this idea from the clinic and doctors and patients kind of bump up against each other and say, okay, so what's wrong and where do you hurt and what's the symptom? And we start working through and trying to help that. We then get to kind of some case reports where we say, hey, look, somebody had such and such and I did this and it worked. Um, then we get into case series and then um, non-controlled observations which get published and then controlled studies which get published and then we get to textbooks. That's kind of how it works. And then about 10 years after the textbook gets published, things start to change. So that puts us on track for about 2020. 
in terms of this really changing within the heart of medicine. This is the first textbook that really addresses the core biology of autism, and it's called Autism, Oxidative Stress, Inflammation, and Immune Abnormalities, and it's right on. It's right on. Um, now, it's a textbook for doctors. It's very technical. If you want to spend a couple hundred bucks and buy it, you can, um, but it's, it's for medicine. It's for researchers. It's for academia, but it's amazing to see it. We actually have that substantiation now. So, um, talking in the lounge yesterday after a bottle of wine and a couple of shots of vodka, I got the idea, hey, it's stress relieving, right? It's appropriate, it's medicinal. Um, I got the idea that I really needed to have an opportunity to set the record straight about some, a few things. So I've published the paper. If I do nothing else with this talk, read the paper and listen to what I'm about to say, because it's really important. You've probably heard it said that vaccines have nothing to do with autism, whether it's, you know, Good Morning America, whomever else, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, your pediatrician. How many of you heard that vaccines have nothing to do with autism? How many of you heard it at least 10 times? Okay, yeah. Um, now, I have a special place in, in my heart for those people, um, um, including the special master who uh, took an opportunity to completely blast me. I have never been so abused by a federal official in my life, and there's been a few that have really tried, but oh my God, I mean, they were just mean, just mean. I don't know if you've read or heard about the special master case involving uh, a good little kid, Colton Snyder, who's a sweetheart of a guy, who's completely recovered. And all they did, they spent about half of the whole um, discourse saying how bad it was that I took care of this kid and got him better, and how wrong it was, because there was no evidence that he needed any of that treatment whatsoever. And they actually said, he probably would have just gotten better on his own. About, let's see, a half hour a week of occupational therapy and one hour a week of speech therapy was all he really needed, according to the special master, to get better. That will work, won't it? I mean, how many of you think that's going to cure autism? It's shocking to me, okay? So we have that kind of political legal environment that we live in, and yet, you know what? There's a lot of stuff out there on vaccines. I'm going to go over a few things just to kind of stir the pot a little bit. Um, the reason for that, I mean, I wasn't going to talk about vaccines at all. And uh, about, was it last week that the American Academy of Pediatrics says the more vaccines you get, the higher your IQ is? <laughs> Did, you didn't see that article? It was published in the American Academy of Pediatrics. The more vaccines you get, the higher your IQ is. You know, those kinds of data happen when you do what to the data? When you, when you lie. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's better coming from him than from me. Um, no, that's when you overly manipulate the statistics, you get that kind of nonsense to come out. It's craziness. Um, I don't believe that for a minute. I don't think that all vaccines are bad, nor do I think that all autism is caused by vaccines. But there are clearly some cases in my practice, doubt in my mind, that vaccines precipitated what we call autism. How many of you think that's a problem for your child individually? That's a lot of you. Now, um, I'm there with you. It's my kid. It's my wife's kid. No question about it. Um, how many of you heard that secretin doesn't work and it's just, it's just complete shenanigans and doesn't belong in autism? Right, okay. It absolutely works. Are you kidding me? Not only that, 80 plus percent of kids, well, about 80 percent of kids that I see in my practice, don't make enough secretin to do the job. Secretin is an important neuropeptide. We know they're deficient. It was published years ago. Secretin absolutely works. But you know how we designed the studies to decide if secretin works? This is something your body makes every time you eat or even snack. It's a very important neuropeptide. It's there almost all the time, throughout the day, frequently, very much like insulin. We designed studies where we gave you a single dose of secretin once a month, came back four to six weeks later and said, hey, guess what, you're still autistic. This stuff doesn't work. Now that would be like giving an insulin-dependent diabetic a shot today and then checking their sugar next month. Guess what? You'd come away with the idea that insulin doesn't work. It's crappy science, quite honestly. It was based on a mother's observation, which is fine as a start, but they didn't really think through the molecule and what it does and how to design it. When we use secretin, we use it after every meal, through a little nasal puff, and you know what? It's sometimes really dramatic. Now, have we done that study yet to prove it? Yes. Is it published? No. You know how I do this study? I prescribe it for your kid. You come back and say, Doc, he's got normal poop. He's talking better, he's feeling better, 
Um, his therapist says he's, he's acquiring skills more often. And we try that for a few months. And then, uh, then typically what we'll say is, well, let's see if we can get by without it and see what happens. This is a standard provocation, reversal, provoca reprovocation drug trial. And we, we stop it and he said, God, you know, his stools are back to being mushy and yellow and green. And he's not doing like he was. Like, guess what? Start it back up. Let's see what happens. That's proof. Science, excuse me. Sorry, microphone. Um, that's proof scientifically. Absolutely. It's not a double blind controlled placebo crossover trial. But I'm going to get to critiquing those in just a minute. Secretin does work. Most recently, you might have heard that the good news that gluten casein free diets won't help your child. <laughs> How many of you have helped your child dramatically with a gluten casein free diet? Okay. How many of you know that if they get a morsel of milk or wheat, they whack out for days and everybody tells you, what did you do to your child? <laughs> that is a provocation, reprovocation child. You go on the diet, you eliminate those things, you provoke with a break in the diet, a therapist, a grandma, sorry grandma, um, a teacher, <laughs> The kid's sitting in the school, in the seat next to him at school, gives the kid gluten or casein, and bam, you've got your symptoms back, just like that. It takes three or four days, five days, you clean it up, and you're back on track again. Okay, so we have scientifically proven that it doesn't work, and absolutely, in my clinical experience, scientifically proven that it does. What's happening here? Group design studies that eliminate a lot of variables, that take away all of the things that happen dynamically within a practice, are removed from a clinical study. And what you have is we're going to modify one variable and only one variable and somehow make that work. Do any of you treat your kids that way? If you're a doctor, do you treat any patients that way? Very rarely. Sometimes if it's a really important inter intervention, we'll only modify one thing. But we have to do multiple things to help these kids. Okay. Now, mild hyperbarics, um, those inflatable chambers, my name is associated with they don't work. You heard that? I wrote it, so I kind of know what my name is associated with. You know why the paper showed up negative? Do you have any idea why? Is it because hyperbarics doesn't work? Or is it like secretin and gluten encasing free diets and the connection to vaccines and all that sort of stuff? It absolutely works when you do it right. Now, in a controlled study, you have one variable. In our situation it was, you either got pressure or you didn't get pressure, that was it. You got the oxygen pressure mix or you didn't. Everything else was supposed to stay the same. We eliminated a lot of kids during the process of studying them because they needed to go on yeast medicine, they had to have a change in their diet, they got sick, they went on antibiotics, other stuff happened to them. And what we got left with was at the end was this modified group. In my practice, I never just give you hyperbarics. I'm going to treat your yeast and your dysbiosis and your clostridia. I'm going to give you antioxidants. I'm going to make sure you have enough glutathione. We're going to do that entire picture. And you know what? Most often I'm going to give you an anti-inflammatory at the same time because what did we just say? Autism is associated with inflammation and oxidative stress. I'm going to treat both of those conditions and give you hyperbarics. And you know what? When I do it that way, which we can't study, no one's going to publish that study. It's almost impossible to publish that study. It works. It works beautifully. So I want to make a public apology to not just uh, the folks at OxyHealth who were wonderfully kind in, in helping to fund that study. Goodness knows they probably spent a million dollars funding research. Uh, and the design let them down. It let us all down, actually. But I want to apologize to Dr. Rosniel and the other doctors in the other hyperbaric study that actually showed that it had a positive effect. We were way too hard on them, way too hard on them in our uh, analysis of, of statistical power. So I apologize. Um, I fell victim to the same sorts of analysis and scientific flawed thinking that everybody I'm critiquing fell victim to, quite honestly. One variable without controlling for the rest of it and you get a bad outcome. So I can't be too hard on my colleagues who say gluten casing free diets don't work because, hey, I did the same crappy studies. The reality is we practice dynamically and we work with these kids and we work with you as parents and we do get them better. We do get them better. The docs that you see talking up here, the researchers, are coming together in a way that is really getting these kids better, and you have lots of reason for hope. So about a year ago, it went unnoticed, but I sent an email to ARI, Autism Research Institute, and I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm not doing any more research, which is a group design study, ever again, because I don't believe it will ever show us the kinds of things that we want to do. 
actually backed out of a diflucan and vancomycin study because of the same thing. They wanted us to, and Dr. Feingold is a brilliant researcher, and I've debated him on this, and he said the university is never going to approve it. I wanted to do diflucan and vanco together, which is an antibiotic and an antifungal for kids who had dysbiosis at the same time. And what the university wanted me to do was vanco or diflucan. You know what? It's an ecosystem. If I pull one thing out of that ecosystem, something's going to fill that vacuum, and it's whatever else is down there, and it happens to be most often in our kids clostridia, which makes bad stuff for these kids and poisons their metabolism, and I would just make them worse. And I've done that and seen it happen. So I backed out of that study. So the only way we can really get answers is to treat the entire patient and do it in a way that allows us to modify the variables appropriately. So we're left with a lot of really crappy outcome studies, mine included. Sadly, but I think we've learned a lot about how to do these research and how to do this. So I'm optimistic. We're going to get it right in the future, hopefully. Now, on to the science. This is um, from some brilliant researchers. Paul Grandjean has worked a lot with mercury, but he's also a toxicologist. And he and his colleagues looked at the, the growth of developmental neurotoxins in our ecosystem. You want to see that slant there? So this is where we have all these adults who are obvious, subclinical populations. And then we have autism, which is a silent pandemic. We're not recognizing it as a neurotoxicological event, but it is. Whether it's mercury in vaccines or aluminum vaccines or other garbage in vaccines or the PCBs that we're using as flame retardants or the, the stuff we're using as chemicals on our food or the sulfite on the food or whatever else it may be. And there's a lot of things that we're doing to manipulate our diet we are exposing our kids in a way that they're telling us in the way that frogs in the ecosystem disclose poisoning of the ecosystem. You know what happens in a pond in the, in the mountains, right? Probably, maybe not, I don't know. Um, the first thing to go are the frogs. They're very sensitive, they live in the water, they have a thin skin, they absorb the toxins, and they go quickly. What about canaries in mine shafts? The miners take them down to disclose if, the ba if there's bad gas present because they don't sense it, but the canaries sense it faster. Our children are telling us that there's a problem. So the 1,000 are known chemicals in the universe that are out there regularly available, uh, greater than 80,000, uh, that children are exposed to. 80,000 chemicals. Do you think we have any clue how they interact in child development? No. Up at the very top are the five that we know mess with kid development. Those are PCBs, solvents, lead, mercury, and arsenic. Now, you can probably add to that some other agents that are recently being discovered, but that's a pretty good list of places to start. Um, now, are any of those associated with autism in the medical research? All of them are. Um, this is an interesting, uh, there's two of these out actually. This one is from Zhu Ming and her colleagues at New Jersey, showing that the closer you live to a, a toxic landfill or a Superfund site, the more likely you are to have autism. They controlled for all the variables that they could, and it's a very interesting geographic sort of distribution. Um, it makes sense that as you keep adding more and more and more, the kids fight back and do their best to try and restabilize, but the symptoms eventually their, and their genetic vulnerability eventually gets to them. So what are the consequences of all this? Whether it's poisons or immune dysregulation or bad gut bugs or the use of antibiotics or the use of acetaminophen at the same time as administration of a vaccine, I'll show you that literature. How many of you were told to give your kids Tylenol when they got a vaccine? Did you know that it was published that that actually increases your risk about 20-fold of getting autism? It's been published. Very few people even saw that literature. We label all of this event neurodevelopmental disorders, whether it's mental retardation, learning disorders, ADHD, or autism spectrum disorders. It's an event that happened during child development that interfered with normal maturation and function of the cellular networks in the brain that need to make the job happen. So my wife keeps bugging me, hey, I'm a mom. I'm not a doctor. Talk my language. It's a little hard to talk about the state of the science and talk all mom speak, but I'm going to do my best, honey. Really, I'm really going to try. Okay. So, you are a genetic individual. Everything about you is determined by your genes, but not. Because your genes live in an environment that regulates the expression of your genes. So that environment impacts your genes and says, turn on or turn off, or you're weak here, you're vulnerable here, or you can defend against this or not. So it's a very complicated interaction between genes and environment, and it's not just mutations. There's been a lot of focus on single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, one point in your DNA that mutates, that makes you 
you know, need more folic acid or you need more B12 because of that or whatever. But the problem is you can have completely normal genes that the environment says turn off and you have the same problem. And the gene mutation isn't there. So gene regulation and gene expression is where we're moving and it's really critical stuff. And it explains why you can have families like I have in my practice, five kids in one family with autism. Oh my God, five kids. Um, they live on disability payments. Dad's a disabled veteran. Um, they've never had to pay for anything. We take care of all their medical bills for them, but five kids with autism, and they haven't killed themselves, okay? That's a, a real blessing, and they're wonderful people, but wow. Um, what happens is the ecosystem of the gut, which is the bacteria, are deranged in autism. Now, how many of you know what I mean by that? Am I connecting with you on that? Not enough. Okay, so bacteria, bugs, and yeast, and maybe even parasites live down there, but they're metabolically active. They make bug poop and bug pee. How about that? Does that work? Okay. <laughs> That's their metabolome, okay? And that bug poop and bug pee gets into the kid's system, and it messes with them. It can turn on their immune system or turn it off. It can poison their neurological system. It can turn on the immune system in the brain. It can create lots of mischief. And if we can get it right, which is really hard. How many of you have been trying to get the ecosystem in your kid's tummy right for a long time and haven't done it? Wait, put your, and haven't yet been able to get there? Okay, yeah. How many of you have done it and their kid is now has a normal gut flora? God bless you. We need to talk to you and maybe harvest some poop from you. Um, <laughs> The reason I say that is because fecal transplants are actually one way to get a normal ecosystem in the GI tract, and I know it sounds really nasty, but it's in the medical literature, so of course we can do it. Um, the immune system through all this loses its proper balance, and that's really the best way to say it. It's, in some ways, it's upregulated, and it's picking a fight, and it's creating all sorts of immune chemistry that's damaging the brain, the, the uh, gut-brain barrier, uh, or the, the, the gut barrier, the brain barrier, and the blood vessels, and it's allowing chemistry to get into the brain and cause a lot of problems. Dr. Theodorus is here, he's done some very excellent work with that. We were in a think tank yesterday, he's published some beautiful stuff that I'm gonna show you some pictures of, just in case you didn't see it in his talk, if you missed his talk. And if you did, buy the DVD and listen to it. It's great stuff. Um, but that balance also oftentimes looks like autoimmunity, and all kinds of different autoimmunity. There's no single obvious pattern. Just parts of the brain, the immune system says, I don't like you, and I'm going to make antibodies to you. Now, whether those cause disease or not is not clear, but it's highly suspicious. So biological rust, that's the easiest way I can explain it. Oxidative stress, free radicals, stuff that, that is the product of the immune system by and large, because when the immune system wants to fight something, it turns on its weaponry, which for the most part generates free radicals, just like when you reach into the medicine cabinet and grab that hydrogen peroxide bottle. Those are really free radicals. Hydrogen peroxide generates peroxides, which are free radicals, and so do lymphocytes and leukocytes and other little critters that live inside your immune system and cause the same sort of things to happen. Now that's good, that kills viruses and bacteria, right? If it's chronically turning on and there's no enemy to fight, who gets the, the battle? Who gets to feel that? the self, okay? We call that oxidative stress, and it's really biological rust. So um, the other part of this, once you start to rust biologically, you start to damage the ability of mitochondria to produce energy. Mitochondria are the little power packs that generate that for the cells, and you know what? The brain needs a lot of it. How many of you feel like you need a bit more right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why the line at Starbucks is usually so long, okay? We need more zip. Now, our kids fade quickly with one of the most energy-demanding tasks that we can put on them. It's called attention. The brain needs a lot of juice to stay attentive. They can do it for a few seconds, and they're gone. And then they have to kind of switch off, re repower, and then they're back on. And they do this even without you knowing it. You think they're attending and they're really slowing down and then they pick back up and they slow down. And it's why you're, a lot of your uh, treatment sessions are so inefficient. And you spend a lot of money on therapists to go nowhere if you don't treat this because they keep losing the juice. 
So we do have mitochondrial cocktails. We can deal with this. We can diagnose this. And it's clearly a problem in autism. There's no doubt that most of the patients that I see have deficient mitochondrial activity. They can't create enough energy to sustain attention, focus, and those sorts of things. How do we traditionally do that? If you have inadequate energy production, we whip it with Ritalin or some stimulant medicine like that to try and make you do even better, right? Or you use caffeine or whatever else. But the truth is, the energy production is not optimal and you can't sustain it, neither can your kids. So that all results in alteration in brain signaling. So the normal communication, the normal pathways that the brain uses to talk are abnormal. So they don't have the same synaptic function, they don't have the same uh, little chemistry that goes between two neurons that actually stimulates the, the brain cells to talk. And for that reason, what do we do? We give them drugs, psychiatric drugs, reuptake inhibitors that block the recycling mechanism. Well, guess what? When you keep blocking recycling for neurotransmitters, just like if you don't have enough resources and you can't recycle, you're going to run out, right? Not just biologically, but the, whole, the planet's about to run out, right? That's why I keep telling you to recycle so that we don't run out of all of our resources. It's the same thing for the brain. You can block it and get some good effects for a while, but the long-term studies on ADHD medicine, just published by Western Australia, shows they don't work. And in fact, the kids who take chronic uh, ADHD medicines tend to do worse long-term than the ones who don't. Wow. And what about the stimulant, I mean, the, um, the SSRI drugs like Prozac? Selexa was just published, large study, showed that Selexa 1 didn't work for autism as a, as a SSRI drug, and in fact, the kids who got it actually did worse. Now, some of you are, have kids on Selexa, and it's life, and I'm happy for you. And it just proves that we can't show everything with group studies, right? So some of you have done okay with that. But, all right, so that's pretty much the lecture. We can all go home now. Um, let's go to some details. Let's go to a few details. This study gets kicked around a lot. This is um, a brain autopsy study with kids with autism or without autism who drowned. It came from Johns Hopkins, so you know it's right, because they never make mistakes at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> um, they said that kids who drowned had a brain that looked inflamed if they had autism, but if they drowned without autism, their brain didn't look inflamed. That seems pretty straightforward, except it isn't, because the course after drowning varied a lot and Dr. Casanova, who's sitting in the audience, was nice enough to say, you know, the pedigree of those brains is a little bit suspicious, and other people don't find any inflammation in the brain of kids with autism. I don't think they have to have inflammation in their brain, but I think their brain is going to respond to inflammation chemistry that gets there through a leaky um, brain barrier and influences it. It doesn't have to be inflamed. It just has to perceive the immune pathology as taking place somewhere else in the body. So this is really nice, and it's very dramatic, but it may not be accurate for most of your kids. Okay? I'm getting a nod from Dr. Casanova. So at least one person in the audience is happy that I said that. <laughs> this is what it looked like. And this is my, this is the, oh my God. I looked at this paper as a father first. And I, I, I think I cried for about an hour after looking at this picture. This is a, the brain of a child who drowned without autism. And that's sad that any child would drown and we'd have their brain under the microscope. That's bad. Um, this is a child with autism who drowned. Now you would say, wow. In Yiddish, it's fishimult, okay? If you know the term, a few of you Jewish folks might pick that one up. It's bad, okay? Really, really bad. Um, it's bad in a way that you're not coming back from. It's bad in a way that there's no recovery from, if that's the case. You may get some improvement in function, but kids who really look like that, they're not coming back. That flew in the face of what I know, which is that most kids get better and many of them recover fully. How can it be if this is really the nature of autism? It doesn't, that doesn't match up. This is too much pathology for the typical kid that I see. And you know what? Other researchers that had looked at brains in the past, they would recognize this degree of cell volume loss even without checking the immune system to see if it's turned on, and they didn't see it. They didn't see that kind of damage. It's much smaller, much, much more complex, but little bits of things that are deranged, not this huge disruption that you see in the study. So, however, they did get one thing right that I think is very important, which is this, that looks like there's a combat zone at the blood vessel interface with the brain. We call that the blood-brain barrier. And I really think that in many of these cases, that's under assault. Now, whether it's opening up and that's causing the immune cells in the brain to react more to what's happening, or there's a virus sitting there that's causing the immune cells to react, that's a critical area of intervention. So that's why when I treat kids 
with hyperbarics, which I use for this reason, because of this presumed assault on the blood vessels, I also use anti-inflammatories to reduce that inflammatory reaction. And we get much more sustained positive effects when we use those two together. Sorry, I haven't done that study and I don't think anybody would ever pay for it. But that's how we practice. Um, Dr. Thea Hardis did this. And I, I'm probably really mispronouncing your name, so I apologize if I'm not even close. But Okay, great, thanks. Anyway, autism and emerging neuroimmune disorder in search of therapy, and we are trying to find the right therapy. And let me tell you, the, the immune system disruption is complicated, and it's not that easy. He is working on some nice sort of combined natural substances, which is very cool to make that happen, and I'd like you to follow his research because I'm very excited about it. This was just published by a colleague of mine at the Imperial College in London. Jeremy Nicholson and I have sat at num numerous think tanks over the years, and he did something that I think is extraordinary. He looked at the entire output of everything that was in the urine of kids with autism, their siblings, and kids that we called neurotypical. Every molecule, because he has some of the highest quality um, high-tech equipment in the world, um, NMR1, H1 uh, equipment that can basically do that, and it's t attached to a supercomputer that can say, this molecule is this, 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 this. And you know what? There's differences. It really comes down to this. I think that's pretty clear, isn't it? I'm kidding, of course, okay? <laughs> that's the net outcome of the paper, all right? And you kind of need a supercomputer to figure it out, okay? The effect is that there's a whole lot of metabolism from bad bacteria in the urine of kids with autism that's not in the urine of healthy kids. Now, exactly what that's doing, we're not sure, but it's a great place to start looking. And it fits what I know clinically, which is that if I clean up the gut, the kids do a lot better. They sleep at night, they stop stimming, they start to learn, and when that's off, they're off completely. This is the conclusion from the paper, but it'll show up on the DVD, don't worry about it. Now, this is a really fancy part of things, and this is basically saying that there's certain things that turn on that put kids at risk for losing brain cells, and it's critical stuff. Um, I just want you to see the fact that scientists not associated with Dan or with crazy autism parents are looking at this and seeing the same thing that we think is going on. That's really what I want you to take home from this. You don't have to know what this compound is, but it puts the kids at risk for an inflammatory brain problem. Um, again, from Dr. Theohardis, mercury induces inflammatory media response in human mast cells. Critical stuff. Now, is mercury the only thing that does that? No. Does that prove that mercury causes autism? No. Does it say that mercury is a good thing? No. Mercury is a bad thing. It's on the top five. It's one of the big ones that we know causes problems with kids' brain. Anyway, these substances, once we turn these on, damage the protection between the brain and the blood vessel, and normally the brain needs to sit behind a castle wall, just like a king and a queen on a throne, protected by their moat, the drawbridge, and the big walls. Now, if you know anything about battles in Europe, guess what? It didn't always work for the king so well. They eventually figured out how to break down the walls, and that's what's happening with the immune system activation, is figuring out how to break down the walls. So, neurodevelopmental effects of chronic exposure to elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines means the visual system doesn't develop normally. If you're chronically inflamed, your visual cortex won't develop the way it needs to. And do you think the thing, same thing is going to apply to the auditory cortex, the, the hearing part of the brain? I think absolutely. And what do we have with our kids? Do they process things visually the same way we do? They do some weird stuff, you know? like. They see things differently. I mean, I've given kids a shot of secretin before and that could talk, and they said, wow, I can see things now. There's not holes anymore. That's, a, that's an intriguing observation from the patient. Um, this is important. Um, we, we have to address this inflammatory, this chronic inflammatory syndrome, whether it's in the brain or if the brain is being impacted by it. We have to get that regulated as best we can as quickly as possible. Um, this was. Excellent. I mean, how many of you read the stuff from the Chicago Tribune that basically said I was a bad doctor? Um, okay. Thank you for being here anyway. God bless you. <laughs> my wife thanks you. Uh, my partner thanks you. I'm sure Dr. Usman thanks you. Thank you for holding on to that, okay? I really hope that you hadn't, but, you know, at any rate. Um, one of the things that, that I got really beat up, both on the telephone and otherwise then, was the fact that IVIG doesn't work for autism. 
There's no reason to use IVIG for autism. I have seen kids dramatically improved with IVIG. I know it works for autism. There's no doubt in my mind it works for kids with autism. Dr. Gupta just published this, which was wonderful, which is a rationale for treatment. And he did it. That's it. We need rational treatment, and we need, to, we need to have a basis for why we're doing this, because you know right now, the studies are too complicated to do. But it's rational to do this in certain cases, and he went through the rationale for why to do it and how to do it. So hey, I got defended a little bit by one of the best immunologists in the world. Um, now, we know that vaccines uh, don't have any association with autism. It's just every time we do a study with animals, it seems that they do have an association with autism. And it seems that they seem to cause autistic features when we give vaccines to, to monkeys and um, other creatures, whether it's lab rats or whatever. So, and this was a study that was um, at, presented at INFAR, and I think it's about to be uh, published soon. Um, if you didn't see Laura Hewson's talk, another, that's another one that you might want to get. But essentially in this study, um, Dr. Walker, who may be here, but he's um, from Wake Forest uh, down in the south, uh, basically said, you know what? The histological changes in the inflammatory bowel disease of animals who get vaccines is drawn lots of their DNA to make inflammation, and we don't see that in the animals that don't get vaccinated. It doesn't say that there's virus persistent there. It says the immune system is a wreck after vaccination, and it's causing an inflammatory change in the gut. Um, this is a great study. I actually talked to Stephen Schultz, who's um, a Navy commander. He's at the School of Aerospace Medicine, where I did my aerospace medicine training in the Air Force. Um, and he said acetaminophen, uh, paracetamol in the, in the UK and, and most of Europe, also typically known as Tylenol, which you can't buy for kids anymore, because McNeil's factory has now been shuttered as of, I think, yesterday for non-compliance with safety regulations from the FDA. Did you hear that? <laughs> Big article in the Wall Street Journal. They're really upset with McNeil over this. They've been trying to get things rearranged. Uh, and Wall Street Journal yesterday said that they were even considering criminal charges, which is, wow. Um, but it's not the contamination, it's the fact that acetaminophen does what to your glutathione levels, do you know? It, good for you guys, it wipes them out. That's why you don't take Tylenol and go drinking. It's also why you don't take Tylenol and give your kid vaccinations. All right, here's the odds ratio, uh, 20.9 to 2.4. So ibuprofen was 2.4 odds ratio and acetaminophen was 20.9 odds ratio that if you got that in conjunction with an MMR vaccine that you would develop autistic features. That's really huge. That's a very large odds ratio difference. Now I spoke to um, the main researcher on the study, Stephen Schultz, via email, and I wish I had, I should have really copied the email here. And I don't want, I don't want to discredit in any way his thinking. If it's, if it's, if it's really the fact, then it's novel thinking and it's not what I thought vaccines were supposed to do. He said that his impression is it's just the Tylenol, it's just the acetaminophen. It's not the MMR vaccine because the MMR vaccine would naturally create viral persistence and the persistence of the virus is what would maintain immunity. Now, if you're a researcher and a physician and you know this, how many of you think that that's why we give vaccines, to create viral persistence? No. I didn't ever learn that, and it's not published anywhere that vaccines are supposed to create viral persistence as a mechanism of creating long-term immunity. I don't believe that, but if it's true, and I and actually know it's true in some cases, it's a problem. Viral persistence immunologically would be potentially catastrophic for these kids. Um, now, this is my proof. Um, now, I published this with Dr. Wakefield, which means that I, I'm surprised I still have a medical license, actually. <laughs> Um, so far, there have been a few attempts, let me tell you. There have been a few attempts to make it go away. Um, so I have some friends at Quack Watch that routinely file complaints that I have to spend a bunch of money to defend. But, um, so what we found with Dr. O'Leary's laboratory was persistence of measles virus in the blood, in the CSF, and in the in intestinal tract. Now, it turns out that when we published this paper, two out of three of the kids had seizure disorders. After we published the paper, the third kid went on to, grand, to develop grand mal epilepsy. Now all three of the kids have had to be on anti-seizure medicines for most of their life. I don't think that's a coincidence. Nor do I think that measles virus normally appears in the spinal fluid. Now we had lots of controls, and we've published 
a larger series with lots of controls in the IMFAR abstracts and presented it there. And we tried to publish it. And we were told by several journals it's too controversial to publish and they wouldn't publish it. Now, that's kind of a little unusual for medicine, um, especially when you're talking about potential viral persistence in the brain of someone after vaccination. But there's this weird bias, and I don't know what it is. We took polio off the market because of why? It caused polio. We can't give live polio to certain populations anymore, right? Because it was too much risk of causing polio. Well, maybe we shouldn't use this form of vaccination to, to prevent measles. Anyway, so it's not just three kids that have this after. They were normal, they got their MMR vaccine, they regressed, and we found measles virus everywhere. Gut, blood, and brain. Not brain, spinal fluid, to be, to be specific. We have found it in the brain through brain biopsies, by the way. So this is um, further attacked by RT-PCR, which is a way to amplify the viral gene and see is it still there. This is in the CSF of kids. Uh, and this is actually 28 children that we looked at versus a large population of controls. And our controls were provided by Dr. Eldar at Tulane University. And that control population, very interestingly enough, had shunts in. These were kids with CSF problems. They had to have a shunt. They had hydrocephalus. They all got vaccinated, but none of them had measles virus in their spinal fluid. We also got some controls from Dr. Walker. Some of those kids had leukemia. One of them uh, with leukemia had, uh, le le actually it was a combined case of lymphoma and leukemia had measles virus and spinal fluid. You could argue that that may be actually part of the problem. Um, then Dr. Walker's group went on to find a very high percentage, 85% of kids who met this criteria with the biopsies from um, Dr. Kriegsman had persistent measles virus in their intestinal tract as well versus an extremely small percentage of controls. Then Dr. Oleski, who is a premier immunologist at New Jersey, had this observation where parents said, I had a normal kid till they got the MMR vaccine. He looked at them, they were immune deficient. He gave them IVIG and a high percentage, 21 out of 27, had dramatic responses. He published that in an internal magazine from the university only. I don't know why. I really wish that got out, but it is published. Um, we know that there appears to be this potential vulnerability. P-selectin abnormality means that you're vulnerable to potential infection in the brain. And at least in adults with autism and Asperger's disease, their P-selectin values are, are deficient, exposing them to this potential problem. So decreased expression may mean why you're vulnerable to having a virus go to your brain in the first place. Um, BDE-47 is a flame retardant. Um, it looks like it has the capability, and we have done some preliminary studies that I think are very exciting, but early exposure to BDE-47, and I can't get all the data out, looks like it will permanently change the thymus gland expression and programming. The thymus gland is the postgraduate school for lymphocytes. They go there to learn how to be really mature lymphocytes and how to do their job, and it looks like it permanently changes the curriculum at the university for them. Make sense? Bad stuff. Where are flame retardants, by the way? Everywhere. They're in your mattress, in your jammies, on your bedding, on your carpet, on your drapes. They're all over the place. The highest levels of BD47 have been found in cord blood of moms from California. So far. Yeah, I don't think the U.S. is particularly clean. Uh, this is their data showing permanent Im uh, that, that the immune system seems to just regulate rather dramatically from this stuff. Again, um, Dr. Theohardis talks about uh, the interaction between oxidative stress, brain regulation of pituitary function and, and adrenal function, and then alteration in our chemistry. And he came up with this really cool picture, okay? It's a beautiful picture, by the way. I love this picture. Um, and it pretty much goes through all of the, of the chemistry that can potentially impact the brain. By the way, a lot of that chemistry, those immune chemicals, have been shown to cause neurological and psychiatric disruption in other studies, whether it's schizophrenia or OCD behaviors or other things. Um, now, gastrointestinal symptoms in kids with autism disorder. You may have even heard it said that kids with autism have the same gut problems as kids without autism. There's no difference between those two populations. Baloney, okay? Hey, if parents put up with the kind of diapers that we put up with, you'd hear about it. Okay, you'd hear about it at church, you'd hear about it in the grocery store, you'd hear about it in your support groups, you'd hear about it in your coffee clutches or whatever. They don't, okay? We have, our, come on, our kids have some of the nastiest diapers in the world, let's face it, okay? They're toxic waste. I actually thought we should send them to Congress one time, but we would all be guilty. <laughs> yeah. 
we would all be guilty of uh, in, uh, environmental terrorism, so we couldn't do that. <laughs> um, it's bad stuff. I mean, now, do all kids with autism have gut problems? No. How many of you have kids with pretty messed up diapers and poop? Okay. How many of you start off that way, but it's not so bad anymore? Okay, good. Um, the gluten casein for diet, antifungals, probiotics, antibiotics, whatever, seems to get us a lot better, and we eventually get to the point where they can have a normal bowel movement and potty train and do that sort of stuff, most often if we deal with it. Um, this was a very interesting um, review article, really, showing that the potential for early life immune insult, um, in, including developmental immunotoxicity, is likely uh, an underpinning of what we see, and I believe this absolutely. I think that if you, whether it's in the womb or shortly thereafter, first one or two years, if you start to change the regulation of the immune system, you will permanently make these kids vulnerable, which is why you can't get off of your stuff. Whether it's IVIG or anti-inflammatories, your kids are stuck having to take that for long periods of time. It's not like you take it for six months and you get better, okay? Um, so I want to go down, this is another part of, this is a very important article. About 60% of the kids that I see appear to have autoantibodies to the blood vessels and work that was done by Dr. Conley. She's replicated this work. We now have thousands of cases where we have sent um, blood to her to have it evaluated. It's a very eloquent study. She takes cadaver brain sections. She takes the blood from kids with autism, puts it on that section of the brain, incubates it, uh, washes it, and then stains it for antibody complex. It means, did any of his immune system antibodies stick to the brain section? About two-thirds of our cases, it does. Now, does that mean it's directly causing it? No, but it's reacting somehow, or something's going on that is highly suspicious that the blood-brain barrier is under immunological direct attack, or that's something there that's causing alterations of that. That's a huge target for intervention. When we see that, we consider a combination of anti-inflammatories and hyperbarics for these kids, and you know what? It's amazing. Oftentimes, they start talking very shortly after we do that combination. Now, I'm going to hop out a little bit because I only have about eight minutes left. And I'm going to bypass a lot of really important stuff. The good news for you, and that's true, it's really important stuff, but I don't have 10 hours. I have about eight minutes, and I want to get to an actual case and show you a little bit of how I process this. Now, um, the really good news for you is that it's all in the paper. So if you ask me for the paper, you'll get it. You can read through this whole process. So. We got to the point of saying, okay, we, it's really hard for us to prove with research studies, because one, we don't have the money for the research studies, and it's very hard to design research studies to emulate what we actually do with our kids, because we vary too many things at once, deliberately, uh, to try and create balance and this homogeneity of, of our kids where we really balance things out for them. But what um, we wanted to do was to, like diabetes and hypertension, the docs who treat that stuff, they got it easy, okay? They put a blood pressure cuff on, they measure it, they give you more drugs if you need more drugs, they check your blood sugar, they give you more insulin if you need more insulin. That, come on, that's easy. Really, I'm, you know, sometimes complicated, but, you know, for most of us as doctors, that's the bread and butter, easy stuff. We can do that right in medical school. We need some biomarkers. We need something that says objectively what's wrong with our kid and why am I doing what am I doing? Why am I giving you antibiotics? Why am I giving you antifungals? Why am I giving you anti-inflammatories? Why am I suggesting you take antioxidants? Because a paper came out last week that said that? Or because the lady next door had a kid with autism and she did and it worked? Sometimes that's reasonable rationale, but not for me as a doctor. I need more than that. So biomarkers. Isoprostane, this I get from a, the laboratory of Philippe Augusta in Paris, and we've put together a, an article. Uh, our research was published in the proceedings of IMFAR, and we found dramatic differences between this and our no normal population, and so did Dr. Ming at the University of New Jersey. This says that the membranes, of which the brain is a critical constituent of just a bunch of membranes, are oxidized. They're biologically rusty, and a lot rusty should be in the under 200 range, actually it says 160 there, but trust me, it's under 200, and it's 618, three times more biological rust than there should be there. That means that the body is throwing away lots of cell membrane stuff. Cysteine, which defends the body against oxidative stress, is deficient, radically deficient in this kid. Oxidation of RNA, the basic factory that makes everything in the body, is a rusty factory, 123 
units compared to 20 to 40 units. Big deal. Now, you've seen the point. We need antioxidants. We need things to, to deal with this. This is an inflammatory marker. Neopterin is what happens when the immune cells turn on. It should be under about 200 or so. This one's 1,147. The immune system is raging. This is a very hot immune system. Calprotectin, which winds up in poop, this stuff is in a marker of inflammatory bowel disease. Unquestionably, this kid's 122. Meets all the criteria for being highly suspicious of inflammatory bowel disease. When we look at markers of intestinal dysbiosis, this is a propionic acid analog. Should be under 150. It's 2,278. It's huge. So are the yeast markers. Some of these yeast markers are very elevated. This is a kid with an abnormal intestinal ecosystem. I now have what I need to treat this person. Is there a single drug that's going to do this? No way. I need antioxidants. I need anti-inflammatories. I need something to get rid of the yeast. I need something to get rid of the bad bacteria. I need all of that. Do I need it sequentially, one at a time? No. By the way, Dr. Feingold, I see you sitting in the back there. I hope you don't take any offense to anything that I said. I love your research. You're brilliant. And I wish I could do the research I need to do the way I need to do it. And you're sitting next to another brilliant research, uh, researcher from uh, Western Ontario, Dr. McFab. We have a great audience. Um, now, when we do this, uh, this just kind of shows the distribution of abnormal bacteria that aren't present. And the yeast was um, one of these species was there. Um, let's get down to this. I'm going to go to the very end. Now. Development is a trajectory, just like a, a rocket launch, right? Time goes by, the kid gets more skills. You plot that out, you have a trajectory. It's not like, hopefully, this along the baseline, where you come back and they say, oh, he's doing a lot better. Better compared to whom? Better compared to himself, usually. But you have to compare to peers. What is normal trajectory? Is your kid on a normal glide path, normal flight path, just like you're monitoring a rocket launch as a NASA scientist or controller, is your kid on a normal launch or is he off course? Most of our kids are off course. A year goes by and they don't get a year's worth of progress. That's the sad news. That is objective evidence that we have to have to know that we're, whatever it is we're doing is sufficient to move the kid forward faster. When I, when I take that typical kid with that picture and they're young, like two or three years old, and we get that all cleaned up for them, their trajectory normalizes. And sometimes with intervention and therapy, it's even better than that. And they quickly join their peer group. It's remarkable. Some of you have heard about that, right? Our next speaker is going to tell you all about that. That, in fact, it's possible to get that trajectory back on track. And it truly is. But you have to have a plan and you have to have a rationale. So I think the science is coming to us. The biomarkers are coming to us. And together, we're able to create a plan that puts this entire mess together. And this is a slide that Dr. Um, Nataf at uh, Laboratory Philippe Augustin Paris put together for me. I love this slide. It's all of that together. The environmental insults, the genes, the immunological consequences, oxidative stress, and all of that coming together to create this issue that we call autism. So I am hopeful, and you had better be hopeful and persistent or you're not going to get the job done. And my wife is going to make sure that I'm persistent, I guarantee you. She's not going to let me rest on this subject. So if you don't have this paper, email me, and I will give you this paper. That's your notes for this entire lecture. It's free, drbrycefreedale.com, and I'll be happy to send this out to you. I hope this has been meaningful and helpful to you, and God bless you all, and I hope your kids recover.